et bienvenue à Marseille. Hello and welcome to Marseille. I'm Marion Jones and this is episode one of my brand new City Break series, Marseille. It's no coincidence, you know, that Marseille rhymes with soleil, because this is one of the very sunniest of the southern French cities. And very much somewhere with a distinctive quality, all of its own. It's French, yes. It's France's second biggest city, in fact. It also has a very regional flavour, Provençal, from Provence. And it's a melting pot, a city where so many peoples from so many different parts of the world have come and settled. It has the most wonderful setting. It's beautiful harbours, open to the sea. It's surrounded by the hills of Provence. First and foremost, a port city, with a portside fish market, boats, trips out to the islands, or along the coast where you will find the Calanque little coves that characterise the area. Somewhere where you can enjoy bouillabaisse, fish soup, or pastis, that aniseed-flavoured liqueur but where the cuisine is equally characterised by couscous and where the markets are full of exotic vegetables and spices from Africa. It, like so many other port cities, has its gritty side too. And one of the things for which it's famous is Marseille Noir, hard-hitting crime novels by a range of authors, all set in the city. I had long wanted to visit Marseille, but I had slight doubts about its reputation, wondering would it really be safe? But now, having been, I can confirm that as two sixty-somethings who parked ourselves right down in the city centre and did lots of out-and-abouting on public transport and on foot, we never once felt unsafe. Although we had, of course, taken the precaution of checking up which areas it might be best to avoid. Anyway, if that's your concern, I'd say go for it. So this, then, is the first episode in the series, a little introduction a run-through of the basic geography and history of the place, which will underpin everything that's to come in future episodes. I'll also be explaining roughly what will be covered in the nine episodes still to come. OK then, so starting at the beginning, Marseille, where is it? It's on the Mediterranean coast, which means it has mild winters and very hot summers, although there is a little bit of a sea breeze to relieve the heat a bit, something you won't find further inland. The other climate thing to mention is le mistral, a very fierce wind, which is rather unpredictable, can be up to 100 kilometres an hour, and just turns up now and then. The locals call it le ballet du ciel, so the sweep of the sky. And I did notice that, again, as in other port cities, the weather and the winds and the tide, all very important. One of the features of our trip was to check every morning which boat trips were running and which weren't. And even though we were there in pretty temperate mid-September, there were days when certain trips were cancelled. So, to pinpoint it a little more precisely, Marseille lies west of the French Riviera, east of the Camargue, and about 500 and something, 530 I think, miles south of Paris. Not only is it France's second biggest city, it's a capital too. Twice over in fact, because it's the capital of the department Bouches-du-Rhône, and also of the region, Provence-Alpes-Côte d'Azur. And it owes its existence, really, to the natural harbour, which is surrounded by hills, white chalk hills, which add to the beauty of the setting. There are 60 kilometres of coastline, actually as part of Marseille, and one of the main features is the Calanque, which is a French word, actually originally a Provençal word, for rocky inlets, little coves with chalk cliffs rising above them. They're very picturesque. Part of their charm is that they're quite isolated. Most of them can't be reached by road, so you've got to walk or take a boat, making them a paradise for walkers and divers. And they gained a new importance in 2012, when a national park was created around them, Le Parc National des Calanques. It's very much an area for underwater exploration too, if you know of Jacques Cousteau, he was there in the 1950s. And very excitingly, in the 1990s, another diver, a local man called Henri Cosquet, found the most amazing submerged cave. Vast, 37 metres down, 175 metres long, I think, and containing ancient cave paintings, the oldest of which date from 27,000 years BC. 
And there's a museum dedicated to finding out more about this just along from the harbour, which I'll certainly be coming back to in a subsequent episode. Another feature of the coast is the islands. There's a little archipelago called Friol, for example. Four little islands a short boat trip away, including, excitingly, the one on which the Chateau d'If was built. You may recognise that from The Count de Monte Cristo, the Alexandre Dumas novel. And then there's the Corniche, five kilometres of coastal road, excellent for a drive or a bus trip, and from which you can see the islands, the mountains, the beaches, all the things that make Marseille special. To focus in a little bit, then, everything really starts with the harbour, which is itself a natural calanque, not as narrow as most of the others, and it really is the centre of the city, not to mention a top photo opportunity, surrounded on both sides by pinkish buildings, a quayside with the fish market, all the little boats collected there, and guarded rather dramatically at the entrance by not one but two forts, one on either side, the Saint-Jean and the Saint-Nicolas. This part is a fishing port and a pleasure port, but just to the north, around the corner, you will find what you might call the business end of Marseille, so the Grand Port Maritime de Marseille, the literally large maritime port of Marseille, which was refurbished, rebuilt in 2008, and is France's largest port, one of the largest in Europe, 200 or so shipping routes coming in and out, and a big cruise port. So, the city centre definitely starts at the harbour and there's a long avenue stretching back from the harbour which I think you could call the backbone of the city. La Canobière, it's called. On there, particularly near the harbour, you find the historic centre of the city. Lots of the museums and monuments cluster around it. Walking up La Canobière into the city, you pass the tourist office pretty soon on your left-hand side and a few minutes later, you come up to the Noai district, very ethnically mixed, a wonderful street market off to the right with all kinds of vegetables and spices and food stalls, and a little further again past that, the Cour Saint-Julien, which is very much the bohemian part of the city. Think street art and restaurants of every ethnicity, musicians, street vendors. Back in the harbour then, if you look to the north and to the south, two quite different sides, On the northern side, so that would be to your right if you're looking towards the sea, the Quartier Populaire, so the working class district, as was at least, an area known as the Le Panier district, somewhere you're definitely going to want to explore. Its history was in windmills and fishermen's cottages and religious communities, similar perhaps to Montmartre in Paris, if you know that. Here, in the 19th and 20th centuries, it became the home for waves of new arrivals from all sorts of places, Corsicans, Italians, Algerians, particularly after 1962 when Algeria gained its independence, and many more from other parts of Africa too. Today, when you go to visit, you will find a hilly area full of narrow streets and sets of steps to help you negotiate your way up, lots and lots of street art, sometimes whole streets where every building is covered, Colourful shop signs, atmospheric for sure, perhaps a bit grungy here and there, opening out now and then to little squares and cobbled streets full of restaurants and independent shops. On the other side of the harbour then, the southern side, a bit posher really, and the main feature there is the church which looks down over the whole city, Notre Dame de la Garde. You're definitely going to want to go up that side too, if only to look around the church and to gaze out over the Corniche and the beaches. So that's a quick summary of Marseille's geography. Very brief, it does actually have 16 different arrondissements, but those are the main areas, I would say. And an equally rapid skate through the history of the city will, I think, also give you some ideas to underpin everything that's coming in subsequent episodes. So, how to summarise? Let's start in 600 BC, when the Greeks arrived realised what a fantastic setting and harbour there was, and pitched camp, making Marseille, or Massalia, as they called it, the oldest French city. They built at least three temples here, to Apollo, Artemis and Athena, and they used it as a base to spread along the coast and up into France. The Romans were here too, arriving in about 49 BC. Christianity arrived in the first century, 
after the departure of the Romans, the Dark Ages. But during the Middle Ages, Marseille emerged as a prosperous port. Shipping trade kept growing and going further and further out to the east. It was from Marseille that the French Crusaders left. Marseille was sometimes independent, a republic. It was fought over by other people. Alfonso of Aragon, for example, arrived in 1423, set the city on fire. But gradually, gradually, it became subsumed into the Kingdom of France. And French kings recognised its importance. Francois I built a fort on the Ile d'If, the Chateau d'If I mentioned just now, to guard the harbour. There was a run-in too with Louis XIV, who, furious that there were anti-royalist feelings in Marseille, arrived to quell the revolt, and while he was there, had the two forts built, the Fort Saint-Nicolas and the Fort Saint-Jean, to guard the harbour. And he set up a cache of weapons here too, l'Arsenal du Roi, the King's Arsenal. So determined was he to know who was coming in out of the city, and to ensure that Marseille submitted to his reign. By this point, so the middle of the 17th century, Marseille's strategic importance was growing, and so was its industry, soap, textiles, and new products like sugar, hitherto unknown in France, and, in 1644, the first coffee believed to have been imported into France. So that was a big moment, and as you can imagine, it soon spread to the rest of the country. In 1720, a major disaster, the plague. The port city was always going to be susceptible, and it's thought that in May of that year, a boat was unloaded from Syria with a false hygiene declaration. So they hadn't checked properly, they signed it off anyway, and yes, on the boat were rats, which had fleas, carrying the plague, and three months later, by the end of August, 500 people were dying every day and it's estimated that half the population of the city were killed. One of the city's long-lasting moments of fame came during the Revolution, when 500 volunteers marched to Paris, singing a song which actually had been written in Strasbourg, but which caught the attention of everyone who heard it along the route, who started calling it La Marseillaise, because it was sung by troops from Marseille. And as you know, it is still today the national anthem. The revolution brought plenty of trouble to Marseille, which was a largely royalist city. Guillotine was set up in the Canabière, just outside the Bourse. And when Napoleon came to power just after the revolution, he tamed Marseille by ordering a maritime blockade which almost destroyed the city. But the 19th century saw prosperity. The port expanded greatly, becoming the port of the empire, so the place from which Boats and people setting off for the colonies departed France. It was the time when many of the great avenues and monuments that you still see today were built. The Longchamp Palace, for example, dates from the 1840s. The Bourse, that imposing colonnaded structure on the Canabière, from which all the maritime trading was going to be controlled, was opened in 1860. And the Notre Dame de la Garde Cathedral dates from the Mid 19th century, too. Another extremely turbulent period was the Second World War. Marseille was occupied by the Germans in November 1942, but it remained an active centre of the French resistance, for which punishment followed. The German troops dynamited the Panier district and the Old Port in January 1943, and there was more destruction in 1944, until finally, on August the 28th, 1944, the city was liberated. The last fighting took place around Notre-Dame-de-la-Garde, and when you go up there you will find there are still bullet holes in the cathedral's façade. Marseille has changed almost beyond recognition since the end of the Second World War. Rebuilding took place, new industries moved in, the port was redeveloped, the city grew and the population moved out of the centre to large housing estates in the suburbs, There was a big influx of new arrivals from Algeria in 1962, when Algeria gained independence, and another big impetus for redevelopment in 1995, when a new project was started, the Projet Europe Méditerranée, so aiming to make Marseille the centre for Mediterranean business, a city which would now play a leading role in southern Europe. Lots more redevelopment, the building, for example, of the Euromed Centre, a vast dolphin-shaped complex of offices and hotels and a cinema, 
and a highly significant moment in 2013 when Marseille was voted the European Capital of Culture, which, among many other things, led to the building of the two biggest and best museums in the city, both of which I'm sure you'll want to visit. So they are the MUCEM, M-U-C-E-M, which stands for Museum of the Civilizations of Europe and the Mediterranean, and the Kosky Museum, named after Henri Kosky, who discovered the prehistoric underwater caves. And to me, that museum sums up something about Marseille. It's a state-of-the-art museum, but it tells a story which began 27,000 years before Christ. So it gives you an idea of the sweep of history in this little part of what we now call France. And the city's motto underlines the idea that Marseille is a place where important things have happened. In Latin, it reads like this. Actibus immensis orbs fulget which means the city shines through its immense deeds. It has a coat of arms, too, to sum everything up, a blue cross on a white or silver background. The blue cross dates from the era of the Crusades, when all the French ports had a cross, different colours to represent the different cities. Marseille's was blue, and there it still is today, on the city arms. Along with a trident symbol to represent the sea and fishing, and a second symbol for trade and commerce, so encapsulating the two things that really make Marseille what it is. If you want to sum up the essence of the city, I think you do have to start with the fact that it is first and foremost a port, or, as I saw it described in French, a port et une porte, so a port and a gateway, a French port which looks out towards the Mediterranean and beyond, to the east and to Africa, a city built on trade, a city where things revolve around fish and boats and the harbour, and to which half a million cruise visitors are brought every year. It's definitely a city with a rich cultural and ethnic mix. I've seen it described somewhere as a cultural and religious crossroads. The two most important religions in the city are Christianity and Islam, but it is also home to one of Europe's largest Jewish populations. Marseille is certainly French, It's certainly also Provençal, with its sunny Mediterranean climate and its Mediterranean cuisine. Think bouillabaisse and navette, those little boat-shaped cakes that you can buy as souvenirs. But it is also overlaid with a very heavy, particularly North African influence. It's a sporty city too, particularly being the home of OM, as they call it, Olympique de Marseille, the football team, who play in blue and white so reflecting the colours from the city coat of arms, which go historically all the way back to the days of the Crusades. Football is huge in Marseille. Let me just mention, for example, that the following were all born in the city. Eric Cantona, Frank Leboeuf, Zinedine Zidane. It's a big student city too, 90,000 of them, and lots and lots of grandes écoles, so the institutes of higher education. And it's a literary city too, ranging from the Thuy, if you like, Marcel Pagnol with his tales of a Provence childhood and his trilogy of plays set in Marseille, all the way to the dark, gritty Marseille noir crime fiction, which is now so popular. It's a city that likes to party and has quite a range of fêtes and festivals and celebrations. The Carnival in March, something in May called La Mer en Fête, so the sea celebrates a summer event known as the Joute Nautique, which translates as nautical jousting, and I fear involves people pushing other people off boats into the water. In September, there's the Fête du Vent, a big kite festival, and the Marseille Fair, and the world's biggest pétanque tournament in which 12,000 people take part. Christmas is huge in Marseille and in Provence generally. Christmas markets, of course, something called Pastoral, which happens, I think, more in the villages than in the city, but which is a sort of living crash where villagers dress up and tell the Christmas story through music and theatre. Other Christmas traditions include the Santons, S-A-N-T-O-N-S, which are little figures made in Provence, collected by Provençal families to make a crash, which tells the Christmas story, but goes much wider too, because figures are collected to represent all the people from a Provençal village the carpenter, the baker, the teacher, the children, and so on. Some people have dozens, if not hundreds, of these things. And lastly, I must mention 
the Provençal tradition of les treize desserts, the thirteen desserts, which are the traditional end to a Christmas meal, and are a whole collection of fruits and dried fruits and nuts. So then, there's lots to talk about, and there will be nine more episodes to come, and I'm just going to run very briefly through what the content of each will be. So, episode two, the next one, I'm going to focus on the history of Marseille and go through the places you can visit where you can learn more about it. Starting perhaps with the plaque in the harbour which commemorates the arrival of the Greeks who founded the city and then going on to various museums which will tell you about the Roman docks or the deportation in World War II, etc. In episode three, I propose to stay around the port and the harbour and talk about what there is to visit there, the forts, the Canebière and Notre-Dame de la Garde. In episode four, let's go to Le Panier on the northern side and see what there is to do and see there. Some interesting things, including a monastery now art gallery, the second cathedral in Marseille, the Major, and a little place called the Maison de la Boule, where you can learn all about the game so beloved by Provençal villagers and people in parks all over Marseille and where, if you get inspired, you can also buy the equipment to take home and try it yourself. In episode 5, I'm going to go down to the right-hand side of the port and visit the two big museums there, the Musem and the Kosuke, and then wander a little further and talk about what else there is down there to see lots of shopping and leisure activities. Episode 6 will be devoted to art and centre around three galleries, the Musée des Beaux-Arts, that's the big one, the Charité, which is the monastery, now an art gallery, and a smaller gallery called Regard de Provence, which specialises in local art. I think I'll call episode 7 Boat Trips and Beaches, and things covered will include the Friol Islands and the Chateau d'If, and a rundown of the beaches, the ones you can walk to, and the ones a little further afield. Episode 8, Food and Shopping. We'll have a look at local specialities the ones you can enjoy in restaurants, the ones you might like to buy to take home, and go on a tour of some of the specialist shops in the city that are of particular interest to visitors. The Boule one I've already mentioned, the shops where you can buy Santon, the ones devoted to the old soap industry, and maybe a quick look at some of the main shopping areas in the city. Episode 9, In the Footsteps of Marcel Pagnol, the 20th century author who came from this area and wrote about it in, I think, all of his works. So, a mini-biography, a look at some of his books, his childhood reminiscences, such as La Gloire de Mon Père, My Father's Glory, and Le Chateau de Ma Mère, My Mother's Castle, and his Marseille trilogy, three plays set on the harbour side in the city, including scenes in a bar which you can still visit today, the Bar de la Marine, and also details of a nice day out from Marseille to Aubagne, where there is the Marcel Pagnol house, now a museum, and the cemetery where he's buried. And lastly, episode 10, the anthology. Pieces by famous authors who visited the city, some Count of Monte Cristo type Daring Do, one or two romances, and a look at the phenomenon known as Marseille Noir, so the crime novels by various authors set here in Marseille. There will be a blog post to accompany every episode, So if you want a quick summary, that's the place to look. There'll be lots of photos there too, and all the links you'll need to pin down the places mentioned in the episode, or maybe find perhaps by the books which I've referred to. I hope you'll be keen to come along on the rest of the Marseille journey, but don't forget either that there are lots of other cities now covered in city breaks. Marseille's our 12th city, and if it's France which particularly interests you, then you might want to have a look at our Bordeaux or Toulouse series, or of course, of course, Paris. We've got other Southern European beauties, Florence and Seville. There are some big hitters, London, Berlin, some smaller, very classy places, think Munich, Edinburgh or Bath in the UK. And always the same approach, the history and culture, which would inform your visit and make sure that when you get there, you really know what you're looking at. So for now then, thank you very much for listening and I hope you'll join me again for our second visit to Marseille. For now then, simply thanks very much and goodbye. Merci bien et au revoir.